In the late 1980s, North American home gamers were living almost completely under the spell of the Nintendo Entertainment System. But in 1989, two companies, one who'd already tried and failed to take on Nintendo, and another a market newcomer but established name in the electronics industry, tried one-upping the competition by kicking off the next generation of consoles. The 16-bit Sega Genesis was released on August 14th, and NEC's TurboGrafx-16, a cosmetically redesigned version of the wildly popular PC Engine, was rolled out nationwide in late August and early September. The two systems would vie for the attention of early adopters, and for most it was their respective software lineups that would be the deciding factor. On this episode of Classic Gaming Quarterly, in the fall and winter of 1989, NEC bolstered an already strong launch lineup and released CD-ROM-based expansion hardware, making the TurboGrafx-16 a tempting alternative to the rival Sega Genesis. <laughs> When the TurboGrafx-16 and Sega Genesis were released in the late summer of 1989, they were both intended to compete with the Nintendo Entertainment System. The PC Engine had been released in Japan in 1987 specifically to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with the Famicom and outsold Nintendo's console the following year. Sega had already tried and failed in both Japan and North America to market a competitive 8-bit system and in 1988 made the jump to 16-bits with the release of the Mega Drive although they still failed to achieve much success in their home country. In the early days of the 16-bit generation as it was here in the U.S., neither the TurboGrafx-16 nor the Genesis were able to do much to displace the NES, and so it was that their primary competition was each other, as they battled for the relative handful of gamers looking to upgrade to more powerful home hardware. The Genesis launched with six games, highlighted by its pack-in title, Altered Beast, Rise from your grave. And the excellent Thunder Force 2. <laughs> and over the course of 1989 fleshed out its library with memorable hits like Ghouls and Ghosts and the Revenge of Shinobi. The pack-in game for the TurboGrafx-16, Keith Courage and Alpha Zones, was an odd choice for Western gamers, but the system had the arguably stronger launch lineup, highlighted by the legendary axe, blazing lasers, and Dungeon Explorer. As summer became autumn, NEC matched pace and then some with Sega, releasing a steady stream of mostly excellent post-launch titles as the TurboGrafx-16 closed out the decade of excess. Born in Nara Prefecture in 1940, Kenzo Tsujimoto was, by the age of 22, already the owner of his own candy store. Tsujimoto went from selling cotton candy to selling the machines that make it and by 1970 had begun manufacturing pachinko machines as the market for coin-operated entertainment was rapidly expanding. In 1974, Tsujimoto formed International Playing Machines, or IPM Company Limited, and in 1978 released their first game, IPM Invader, a rather obvious clone of Taito's Space Invaders, albeit in full color rather than black and white. <laughs> The following year, International Playing Machines changed its name to International Rental Electronics Machines, better known as IRAM. Although Tsujimoto left the company in 1983, in the early 80s IRAM developed a number of games that saw success in the West, including Moon Patrol, Ten Yard Fight, Vigilante
and Load Runner. But the game for which they are perhaps most well known was ostensibly created as a response to the runaway success of Konami's 1985 hit Gradius. Released in Japanese arcades in the summer of 1987, R-Type is a horizontally scrolling shooter that has you piloting the R-9A Arrowhead against the evil forces of the Baito Empire. Less than a year after the game's original arcade release, R-Type made its first appearance on a home game console in March of 1988 as R-Type 1 on the PC Engine. Due to the memory constraints of early Hue card games, it contained only the first four levels of the arcade original, and was joined three months later by R-Type 2, which contained levels 5 through 8. As it was effectively one game split across two hue cards, at the completion of R-Type 1, the player is given a password that, when entered into R-Type 2, carries over both the score and weapons upgrades. After the two halves of R-Type were released on the PC Engine, a complete version of the game, ported by famed shooter developer Compile, was released on the Sega Master System, making it for a short time the best home version of the game. But in November of 1989, with the memory capacity of the Hue card having been increased from 2 megabits to 4, R-Type was put back together for release on the TurboGrafx-16. In the arcade, R-Type runs at 384 by 256 a higher resolution than most games of its day. Rather than shrinking the game down to a standard 240p resolution and losing detail in the process, as was done with the Master System version, on the PC Engine and Turbo Graphics, the playfield scrolls slightly so that the game's original graphics could be preserved. This scrolling is off-putting to some people, but to be honest, I don't even really notice it while playing. In 1987, R-Type's graphics were among the best yet seen in a shooter, and the game looked no less impressive two years later on the Turbo Graphics. While the visuals do expectedly take a slight hit, mostly due to the color palette, the detail from the arcade original is well preserved here. The R9A's weaponry is also a standout feature of the game. While the members of the design team were fans of Konami's seminal shooter, they made a conscious effort to create a game that couldn't simply be dismissed as its clone, wanting to leave their own unique mark on the genre. The two most unique features of the game at the time of its release were the ability to charge up a more powerful shot by holding down the fire button, helpful for dispatching enemies that take multiple normal shots to kill, and the Force Pod. The Force Pod is a helper ship of sorts, not unlike the options in Gradius, except that rather than just mirroring the arrowhead's movement, the player actually has control over what the Force Pod is doing. You can attach it to the front or back of your ship, where it will both fire in the appropriate direction and act as a shield, or you can send it out as a remote secondary weapon. In addition to the Force Pod, homing missiles can be acquired, and the main gun on the arrowhead can be upgraded in a few different ways. Most shooters strike some balance between reflexive frenetic gameplay and the need for level memorization, and R-Type definitely skews towards the latter when compared to its contemporaries. There is very much a path you need to follow to get through the levels, and if you wander you can easily find yourself out of position, the consequence of which is usually death. That's not a knock, but rather just an indicator that the key to proficiency with this game is repetition, and a lot of it. Generally when you die you know exactly what you did wrong, and can hopefully avoid doing it again the next time through. Do this same thing about a hundred times in a hundred different places, and you'll have mastered R-Type. While the game is known for its brutal difficulty, it's also one of the most beloved shooters of all time. In the past, I never really considered myself much of an R-Type fan, but found myself playing this game for hours on end in preparation for this episode, as rather than getting frustrated and walking away, every time I died I wanted to jump back in just one more time. 
Jazz for Irem founder Kenzo Tsujimoto after leaving the company in 1983, another of his ventures, Japan Capsule Computer Company, was renamed to Capcom, where he still serves as CEO to this day. One of the most prolific arcade developers of the Golden Age, Namco is best known for hits like Dig Dug, Pole Position, and of course the Pac-Man franchise. whose notoriety extends beyond the world of video games. But the game that thrust them onto the international stage was a Space Invaders derivative called Galaxian. Released in 1979, Galaxian was in color, unlike Space Invaders, and enemies flew out of formation to attack your ship, the Galaxian. Galaxian was one of the most visually impressive arcade games at the time of its release, with multicolored sprites and a scrolling star field in the background, and in many ways was a visual trendsetter for arcade games in the early 80s. Galaxian was followed up in 1981 by Galaga, also pronounced Galaga, which would become the most successful game in the series. In this installment, waves of enemies fly onto the screen in circular paths before taking up formation. It's also possible to have your ship captured by the enemies, which you can then rescue and use to form a super ship, doubling your firepower. The game also introduced bonus stages, in which waves of enemies dance onto and off of the screen without posing a threat. In 1984, Namco released Ga Plus, also known as Galaga 3. Ga Plus was a major audiovisual upgrade over Galaga and features new gameplay elements like the ability to capture enemies and put them to work, massively increasing your offensive capabilities. It also introduced levels in which enemies fly onto and back off of the screen, rather than gathering up in a grid-like formation. Three years later, Galaga 88 was released in 1987 as the last installment of the franchise during the classic arcade era. As with every iteration before it, Galaga 88 was a logical evolution of the series. Running on Namco's System 1 arcade hardware, the game also has expectedly flashier graphics and better sound. In the summer of 1988, Galaga 88 was ported to the PC Engine, and the game was localized for and released on the TurboGrafx-16 in November of 1989 as Galaga 90. The game has, of course, been reconfigured to run in the normal home aspect ratio of 4-3 and is therefore not arcade perfect, but it's a very respectable home conversion of what is, for me, the pinnacle of the Galaga series. At the beginning of the game, you have the choice to start with a normal ship and two extra lives, or you can choose to begin with a double ship and just one life in reserve. You can, of course, still go through the ship capturing routine to create a double ship. But in Galaga 90, you can do it a second time to form a triple fighter. Which not only allows you to fire three missiles at the same time, but also removes the restriction on your rate of fire, allowing you to mow down enemies as fast as your thumb can hit the button. Fans of Galaga should feel right at home with Galaga 90. Waves of enemies dance onto the screen before taking up formation, and you can move your ship left or right, but not forward or back, avoiding both enemy fire and kamikaze galagas. These enemies, however, are more varied and more dynamic. Some enemies come together to form larger ones that take several hits to kill, while others blow apart the multiple smaller ones. In addition to the standard single-screen levels traditional to the series, Galaga 90 features scrolling levels, that play more like a modern shooter, even culminating in a boss battle. The game also adds the ability to warp between dimensions. Capturing two warp capsules in between each bonus stage allows you to warp to the next dimension once the challenging stage is complete. 
Higher dimensions are more difficult, but also provide the opportunity to earn higher scores. Galaga 90 received mixed reviews at the time of its release, with some seeing it as a nearly 10-year-old game with a fresh coat of paint on it. While it's true that the game does have more in common with titles from the classic arcade era than it does with some shooters from the late 80s and early 90s, what it does, it does well, and the same cannot necessarily be said about many of its cookie-cutter contemporaries. And as a result, Galaga 90 takes a place on many people's lists of top games for the TurboGrafx-16. Baseball in Japan got its start as a schoolyard game when American English professor Horace Wilson introduced it to his students in 1872. By the 1930s, the game had established a foothold in Japan as a professional sport, and in 1950, their present-day major league, Nippon Professional Baseball, was established. Today, baseball is one of Japan's most popular sports, and as a result, the country produces some of the world's greatest players. It should therefore come as no surprise that Japanese game developers created many of the iconic games of the 1980s, including Namco's RBI Baseball, Jalico's Bases Loaded, SNK's Baseball Stars, and Sega's Super League, a home port of which was released in North America as Tommy Lasorda Baseball. With the near-instant success of the PC Engine, Hudson sought to establish their own baseball game for the platform, and in the summer of 1988 released Power League, the first edition in a franchise that saw yearly installments through most of the PC Engine's lifetime. The game is completely unlicensed, but Power League features 12 teams, whose names and uniform colors bear a striking resemblance to the 12 teams competing in the Nippon Professional Baseball League at the time of the game's release. This would continue to be the case in subsequent entries in the series, with the Blades even becoming the Blue Wave when the Oryx Braves became the Oryx Blue Wave in 1991. Licensed teams finally began appearing in the series with the release of Power League 5 in 1992. In 1989, Hudson localized Power League for release in the West, renaming it World Class Baseball. The game presents you with five modes of play, corresponding to one or two player games, a playoff mode complete with a password-based save system, the ability to watch a game if you're into that sort of thing, and an edit mode, which allows you to change up the lineup of your team, including subbing in bench players, and even calling up minor leaguers from the farm team. Gone are the knockoff NPB teams, but rather than replacing them with knockoff MLB teams, as the game implies, Hudson chose to create a fictitious World Baseball League, with teams like the New York Apples, Bangkok Buddhas, Moscow Bears, and Peking Ducks. In the pitcher batter view, which you of course spend most of the game looking at, the graphics are much more realistic than the cartoony visuals that prevailed during the 8-bit era, with properly proportioned characters, and of course a greater amount of detail thanks to the system's superior color palette. Much like Tommy Lasorda Baseball, World Class Baseball uses an overhead instead of three-quarter view of the field when the ball is in play. So similar in fact are the two games that it seems rather obvious that the developers at Hudson base the game's design on Sega's Super League. The game offers the same level of control over your pitching as most games of the era, letting you throw fastball sinkers and curveballs by pressing the D-pad while throwing. A standout feature of the pitching is the ability to throw a very late slider. The computer makes regular use of this, and you should too. Fielders tend to be rather slow throwing the ball, so that what should be an easy out to the shortstop or third baseman often turns into a base hit. While this does make the game less realistic, it affects both teams equally, so that neither team gains an advantage. Although a TV sports baseball was planned for release on the TurboGrafx-16, 
World Class Baseball was ultimately the only baseball game released for the system. This is a real shame because Power League was the first in a franchise of games that saw yearly releases on the PC Engine between 1988 and 1993, and the first was, understandably, the most primitive in the series. But even as is, World Class Baseball is a solid title that more than fits the bill for a baseball game on the TurboGrafx-16. Although not the first scrolling shooter ever developed, Namco's 1982 landmark title Xevious was an early and influential release in the genre. Designed by Masanobu Endo, the game established a template for the plethora of vertically scrolling shooters that would be released throughout the 80s and early 90s. A lesser used gameplay mechanic that Xevious employed was a dual weapon system in which the ship can fire both straight ahead and drop bombs. With the exception of Xevious' own sequel, 1984's Super Xevious, the next Namco game to follow this formula was 1987's Dragon Spirit. Dragon Spirit was ported to the PC Engine in late 1988 and was released on the TurboGrafx-16 in November of 1989. Much like Galaga 88, Dragon Spirit was altered to accommodate the 4-3 aspect ratio of home TVs, but is otherwise a mostly faithful home conversion. While the vast majority of arcade shooters involve either airplanes or spaceships, Dragon Spirit takes place in a fantasy world and has you controlling a flying dragon named Amul, who, naturally, is trying to save Princess Alicia from the serpent demon Zawel. Power-ups in Dragon Spirit come in two primary forms, and are obtained by either breaking open colored eggs lying on the ground or by killing flashing enemies. Blue power-up orbs give Amul an extra head up to a maximum of three, while red orbs advance the fire meter, which when full levels up the dragon's main weapon. In addition to these two main power-ups, there are also other pickup items, including weapon modifiers and extra lives. While R-Type's R9A Arrowhead has a very small hitbox at the center of the sprite, Amul's hitbox is huge in that it's literally the entire sprite. And as he gains extra heads, his sprite grows incrementally larger still. Namco must have known that this was a problem, as one of the power-up items shrinks Amul down to a more manageable size. The dragon controls somewhat sluggishly, feeling like you're trying to maneuver a B-52 bomber through waves of enemy fighters. Lastly, Dragon Spirit gives you the standard three lives, but no continues. The game presents itself well, with attractive graphics and appropriate music, and does have a welcome visual diversity among its stages. That being said, vibrant graphics and catchy chiptunes are kind of the system's thing, rather than being a strong selling point for an individual game. Aside from the game's unique premise, it's an inferior iteration in an already well-represented genre on the TurboGrafx-16. With no shortage of arcade shooters to choose from, even this early in its lifespan, Dragon Spirit is not a game for which I could see plunking down $50 when it came out. That being said, it's still good for its share of fun, and would have made for a perfectly respectable weekend rental. Considering that in late 1989, Sega and Hudson were competing with one another to divert gamers' attention away from the runaway hit Nintendo Entertainment System, one might not expect a game developed by one to appear on the other's console. However, not one but two Sega arcade hits saw a release on the TurboGrafx-16. How could this come to be, you might wonder? Recall that at this point, Sega had yet to release a truly popular video game system in its home country, while the PC Engine was taking the market by storm. Sega was, however, an extremely successful arcade developer, 
So when NEC sought to license their arcade properties and handle the porting, Sega had nothing to lose and a lot to gain. A total of six Sega arcade games were published on the PC Engine by NEC Avenue, including Afterburner 2, Fantasy Zone, Outrun, Space Harrier, and Thunderblade on Hue Card, with eventual Genesis launch title Altered Beast appearing on Hue Card and CD. Additionally, both Power Drift and Shinobi were brought to the PC Engine by Asmic, and Game Gear Standout Columns was ported by Lasersoft. Fantasy Zone was originally released on Sega's System 16 arcade hardware, which would become the basis for the hardware design of the Genesis. The game was designed by Yoji Ishii, who was instructed to create a game that would compete with Konami's Gradius in the arcades. But much like the designers of R-Type, Ishii wanted to avoid making a clone game, and so chose to use a pastel color scheme, a hand-drawn graphical style, and a level design that both wrapped around and allowed the player to move both right and left. The game was released in the arcades in 1985 and was a launch title for the Sega Master System when it was released in North America in late 1986. The PC Engine port was released in October of 1988, and the game was localized for the TurboGrafx-16 and hit store shelves in November of 1989. In Fantasy Zone, you take control of the sentient spaceship Opa Opa, who is trying to save its world, the Fantasy Zone, from alien invaders. In each level, you need to destroy the eight alien bases, as shown on the map of sorts in the bottom of the screen, which will then trigger a boss battle. Vanquished enemies drop coins, which can then be used to buy limited-use weapons and ship upgrades, and even extra lives, from a shop that periodically appears in each level. Fantasy Zone's cutesy soundtrack was composed by Hiroshi Kawaguchi, who wrote the music for a number of classic Sega arcade titles, including Hang On, Space Harrier, Afterburner, and unquestionably most famously, Outrun. While the game certainly looks cute with its pastel color scheme and cartoony cast of characters, Fantasy Zone is anything but child's play, offering up a level of difficulty easily on par with its contemporary releases, Gradius and R-Type. One of the more well-known novelties of both the PC Engine and TurboGrafx-16 is the inclusion of turbo switches on the stock controllers, and while I do use them on some games from time to time, never have I found the turbo function as effective as I do with Fantasy Zone, as it practically turns the game into a cakewalk. Perhaps that's a good thing, because like Dragon Spirit, Fantasy Zone gives you no continues. Fantasy Zone is an impressive and fun game regardless of the platform you're playing it on, but I can't help but feel a bit disappointed by this NEC port. The game is worlds better than Tengen's NES port, but is only a marginal improvement over the 1986 Master System version. NEC's hardware was certainly capable of running a better quality port than this, but when it came out in the fall of 1989, it was the best home version of Fantasy Zone available in North America. The TurboGrafx-16 became the first home console to support games on compact disc when the Turbo CD peripheral was released in November. Included in the package was the drive itself, which looked like a fairly standard portable CD player, a large interface unit on which both the optical drive and the TurboGrafx itself were mounted, and a large hard plastic carrying case to store the whole thing in. This large, unwieldy assembly was unavoidable once the decision was made to redesign the PC engine for overseas markets and is sadly much less sleek looking than its Japanese counterpart. At the time of its release, the system cost $399, over $800 adjusted for inflation, and did not include a game. But when it came out, the Turbo CD was cutting-edge technology at a time when even those playing games on more advanced home computers were largely still loading games off floppy disks. The CD drive can be separated from the interface unit and plugged directly into a home stereo, or you can play music CDs using the system's video control panel if you leave everything intact. In addition to playing regular music CDs, like many CD-based game systems of the era, the Turbo CD can also take advantage of the CDG standard. 
This relatively short-lived format allows for CDG-enabled audio CDs to, when played in a compatible player, display low-resolution graphics along with the music. While the ability to listen to music CDs at a time when home CD players were far from ubiquitous was a nice feature, the main selling points of the Turbo CD were the seemingly unlimited storage space offered by the format, and of course the CD quality audio. which at the time was a major potential upgrade over chiptunes when executed correctly. The Turbo CD's interface unit also features composite video and stereo audio outputs, which the Turbo Graphics itself lacks, and contains backup RAM to store game save data for compatible games, which again is not possible with the standalone console. Aside from the price, the Achilles heel of the system around the time of its release was a glaring lack of software, as only two games were released for it by the end of the year. NEC stuck with the format, though, even integrating the CD drive into the console itself with the release of 1992's Turbo Duo. And a total of 44 games were officially released for it in North America between 1989 and 1993. Kung Fu Master was released by Irem in 1984 and is a side-scrolling action game in which the Kung Fu Master Thomas has to rescue his girlfriend from the Devil's Temple Pagoda. The game was popular enough to be ported to just about every home gaming platform of the day, including the NES, where it was released simply as Kung Fu. Kung Fu Master is often credited as the game that created the beat-em-up genre, although I'd personally give that nod to 1986's Renegade. What I would credit Kung Fu Master for is planting the seed for what would become quite possibly the most popular genre of video games in the 1990s. The game was designed by Takashi Nishiyama, who got its start in the industry working at Irem designing 1982's Moon Patrol before creating Kung Fu Master. It would be his last game with Irem because in 1985 he moved to Capcom, where after designing Section Z and Trojan, in 1987, he helped launch two of the most beloved and enduring gaming franchises of all time. He produced the first Rockman game on the Famicom, of course released in North America as Mega Man, and directed the development of the original Street Fighter. Street Fighter II is one of the most influential and imitated games of all time, and is largely responsible for the resurgence in popularity enjoyed by arcades in the early 1990s. The original Street Fighter, however, was far less popular and is relatively unknown to the majority of gamers. As is every subsequent game in the series, Street Fighter is a one-on-one -on -one competitive brawler in which you have to win two out of three timed fights to win the match. In this original game, only Ryu and Ken are playable and are hard assigned to player one and two respectively. The two characters look the same as we know them today, except that Ryu is for some reason a redhead and is wearing ruby slippers. Wanting to improve upon his design of Kung Fu Master, Nishiyama's contributions to Street Fighter's design include Ryu and Ken's special attacks, which of course require special button combinations to execute, and it was he who suggested the six-button control scheme at a time when the vast majority of arcade games used a maximum of three. There is also a much rarer variant of the arcade cabinet that uses large pressure-sensitive pads instead of buttons. According to Nishiyama, the Hadouken was inspired by the wave motion gun of the titular ship in the space battleship Yamato anime series, better known to North Americans as Star Blazers. Street Fighter is quite noticeably less polished when compared to its successors. The movement of the characters lacks the fluidity found in later releases, the controls are stiff and unresponsive, and the special moves hard to pull off without resorting to straight button mashing. Most of the enemies will be unfamiliar to those whose Street Fighter experience begins with the later titles, although I would venture to guess that Mike, who you fight in front of Mount Rushmore, probably evolved into Balrog. There are a total of eight enemy characters to fight in four different countries, and once you defeat all eight, 
you move on to Thailand, where after defeating a ninth fairly forgettable foe, you square off against familiar face and Muay Thai master Sagat. Street Fighter has understandably less detailed graphics due to the game's age, but still looks good for a 1987 release, and in particular has some great looking backgrounds. Likewise, the sound effects are more primitive and the digitized speech much more muffled. But Street Fighter does manage to put out some quality chiptunes. Although the game was released on almost every popular home computer system back in the day, the only home console conversion of the game came to the Turbo CD, where it was released as Fighting Street, and it was the only game available when the CD system appeared in stores sometime in November. The game's graphics have of course taken a hit, although any expectations of arcade perfection would have been based outside the bounds of reality. The digitized speech is slightly clearer, but the soundtrack has received a major upgrade in the form of Redbook Audio. Unlike the PC Engine version of Street Fighter II Champion Edition, which could be used with a Japanese six-button pad, this version of the original Street Fighter only uses two buttons, with the strengths of your attacks dictated by how long you hold the button down. This home version of Street Fighter was one of the first games developed by Alpha System, who in the late 80s and early 90s exclusively developed games for NEC's hardware, including E's Book 1 and 2 and the Super Graphics port of Ghouls and Ghosts. Unfortunately, Fighting Street is a somewhat mediocre home conversion of an already mediocre arcade title, and the fact that it was the only game available at the launch of a $400 peripheral for a $200 video game console was just another example of a marketing misstep by NEC, certainly doing nothing to help push hardware out the door. In 1990, Takashi Nishiyama was hired away from Capcom by SNK, where he helped develop the Neo Geo platform. In fact, it was Nishiyama who both came up with the idea for the system to have interchangeable cartridges and for SNK to release a home console capable of running the exact same software. Although he had a hand in the creation of many of the classics on the Neo Geo platform, perhaps his biggest contribution was the creation of SNK's most famous fighter franchise, Fatal Fury. In 2000, Nishiyama left SNK to co-found DIMPS, which in 2008, alongside Capcom, co-developed Street Fighter IV, bringing Nishiyama's career full circle. The first of two tennis games to hit the TurboGrafx-16, World Court Tennis was available in stores in December of 1989. The game was based on Pro Tennis World Court, a 1988 Japan-only System 1 release that runs on the same hardware as the aforementioned Galaga 88 and Dragon Spirit, as well as Splatterhouse. <laughs> While tennis games didn't really hit my radar until the outstanding Virtua Tennis was released on the Dreamcast, game. Oh, yeah. First game. World Court is a decently fun game that compares favorably to its contemporaries on the NES. Expectedly, World Court Tennis allows you to choose between a singles and doubles match, but while the arcade game was limited to two players, World Court Tennis allows for four players to play a doubles match using the Turbo Tap. Control-wise, you have all the trappings of a standard tennis game. The ability to direct your shot, backhands, forehands, lobs, topspin, backspin, etc. When the game was ported to the PC Engine, 
a quest mode was added that makes World Court play like a tennis and fantasy role-playing game hybrid, complete with a password-based save system. The king of the tennis kingdom needs your help to fight the evil tennis king. Really? All right. You roam around the land getting into random battles in the form of one-game tennis matches. And if you lose, you get sent back to the king, who just gives you a meaningless amount of money and a pat on the head and sends you on your way. You can visit towns to upgrade your gear and then try to beat the bosses located at each of the land's tennis courts. And apparently Rick from Splatterhouse makes an appearance, so that's kind of cool. While this odd combination worked for 1990's Final Lap Twin, it falls pretty flat here and adds no real value to the game. But that's okay, because you can just skip it and stick to the basics. As a standalone tennis game, World Court really isn't too bad, and at least in my opinion is superior to 1991's Davis Cup Tennis. Lot 40. Moto Rotor is a top-down combat racing game and was the second TurboGrafx-16 game to support five-player play via the TurboTap. Moto Rotor takes place in the distant future, the year 2015, when all the problems of humankind have been solved and the only thing that can break the monotony of a trouble-free existence is high-octane motorsports. When the game starts up, with the help of a headset-clad grid girl, you choose from one of seven courses, each of which has eight individual heats. Prior to each race, a helicopter gives you a preview of the course before you're taken to the part selection screen, where you can buy upgrades and special weapons. In addition to purchasing better engines, brakes, and tires, it's here that you can choose between the game's two control schemes by installing Handle A or B. With the default setting, Handle A, you control the car by pressing the direction that you want to go in, regardless of the car's orientation. I had a hard time adjusting to this mode, so I chose Handle B, which makes the game control just like RC Pro-Am. Unlike RC Pro-Am, however, Moto Rotor keeps all five cars on the screen. If any car falls too far behind, the game automatically warps it forward and deducts some extra fuel. I find this irritating as it often places your car in a terrible position or orientation, only compounding the problem if you're already too slow. You can buy grenades and bombs in the parts shop, but unlike RC Pro-Am, they don't really work that well and almost seem like they were added as an afterthought. There's also not much visual variation between courses, so while the layouts do change, they also feel the same. Moto Rotor was followed up in Japan in 1991 with Moto Rotor 2, which simply takes the formula from the first game and amps it up with more advanced vehicles and, thankfully, a wider variety of tracks. And the series closed out with 1992's Moto Rotor MC a Super CD-ROM release that turns Moto Rotor into something more akin to Super Off-Road or Danny Sullivan's Indie Heat. Moto Rotor seems like a fun party game, but I can't imagine buying this game back in the day with single-player play in mind. Moto Rotor may have its fans, but compared to its contemporary releases in the early days of the TurboGrafx-16, it's more the kind of game that you would have been stuck with if on a Friday night you got to the rental store too late to rent anything good. Section Z, a 1985 Capcom arcade release, is a horizontally and vertically scrolling shooter, which instead of the usual spaceship, features a little dude with a jetpack who's been sent into an alien space station that's orbiting Earth. Section Z's unique hook in 1985 was the ability for the player to fire both left and right, useful because enemies regularly appear from both sides of the screen. 
Section Z was the first installment in what is colloquially known as Capcom's Jetpack trilogy of shooters. Capcom ported the game to the Famicom, and a Western localization was released on the NES in 1987. In 1986, Hyper Dine Sidearms, better known simply as Sidearms, was released on Capcom's Commando hardware, which on top of running its namesake game, is also home to Gunsmoke, as well as 1943. As was the case with Street Fighter, although Sidearms was released on all the usual computer platforms, NEC's was the only home game console to host a port, which was released in the summer of 1989. The game was localized for the North American market, and in December was released on the TurboGrafx-16. This version dropped the Hyperdyne from the label, simply calling it Sidearms, although the title screen remains unchanged. The game has a more than passing resemblance to Capcom's Forgotten Worlds, which was the third installment in Capcom's series of jetpack shooters, a home conversion of which was coincidentally released on the Genesis at right about the same time that Sidearms was hitting the Turbo Graphics. The main character is a flying mech called the Mobile Suit, and picking up an Alpha symbol summons the Alpha Drone which combines with the mobile suit, forming a super mech that fires in eight directions simultaneously and effectively gives you another hit point, as taking a shot will simply revert you back to your initial state. You can shoot to the right or left by pressing button one or two, and you can pick up extra weapons, but it's up to you to choose between them, calling up a menu by pressing the run button. The most effective weapon in the game is probably the shotgun, as it not only kills enemies, but their projectiles as well. Other power-ups include speed increases and decreases, orbital bits that can move around your ship as defensive weapons, and both strawberries and cows, both of which act as points bonuses. Once again, Sidearms has nice graphics and great music. But once again, in and of itself, Sensory candy is just not enough. In terms of gameplay, Sidearms has a great premise and certainly isn't a bad game, but it's at least as hard as our type, but simply not as fun. Sidearms was also the sixth shooter released on the TurboGrafx-16 in its first four months on the market, and at some point, genre fatigue starts to set in. If I were to rank the 1989 shooters on the TurboGrafx, it would probably be in the lower third making the game simply uncompelling compared to its peers. Here in the modern day, however, Sidearms is a generally well-regarded game that is certainly worth having a look at if you're looking for a new shooter on the TurboGrafx to sink your teeth into. The original Wonder Boy was released by Sega in 1986 on their then-aging System 1 arcade hardware. The game is a side-scrolling platformer in which the main character, the eponymous Wonder Boy Tom Tom, has to save his girlfriend Tina from the Dark King. At the outset, he is unarmed, but can pick up a stone hatchet to hurl at enemies, and can also find a skateboard, allowing him to traverse the level more quickly, as well as giving him a second hit point. Wonder Boy also has a health meter that effectively acts as a timer in that it constantly depletes, but is partially refilled by picking up the fruit and other food found throughout each level. Wonder Boy actually has a fairly complicated but interesting history. Although the game was published by Sega, it was developed by Escape. Sega owned the rights to the title and characters, but Escape owned the game's code, and the same year that Sega released Wonder Boy in the arcades, Escape licensed the game to Hudson Soft, who released it on the Famicom and MSX as Adventure Island. From this unique arrangement, two completely separate game franchises were born. 
with Hudson releasing numerous sequels to Adventure Island, while Escape continued developing Wonder Boy games for Sega. In 1987, Escape, now called Westone, developed Wonder Boy and Monster Land for Sega's System 2. While still retaining the basic elements of a platformer, Monster Land added RPG elements, creating a side-scrolling adventure game. Again, Westone retained ownership of the source code, which Hudson again licensed, releasing Bakuri Man World on the PC Engine. In 1988, Westone developed Wonder Boy 3 Monster Layer for Sega's System 16. The game is radically different from its predecessors in terms of gameplay, although it does maintain a similar atmosphere. The game alternates between auto-scrolling run-and-gun levels in which you still have a life bar that you refill by eating fruit, and horizontally scrolling shooter levels in which you ride on a flying dragon. This is a pretty clear departure from Monster Land, so in 1989, Westone developed another Wonder Boy 3, Wonder Boy 3 The Dragon's Trap for the Sega Master System. This game more closely resembles the action RPG that was Monster Land, and eventually made its way to the TurboGrafx-16 as Dragon's Curse in 1991. Two more Wonder Boy action RPG games would be released on the Mega Drive, including 1991's Wonder Boy and Monster World, which was brought to the Genesis, and 1994's Monster World 4, which was not. In 1989, Alpha System converted Wonder Boy 3 Monster Layer for the PC Engine CD. It was released here in North America in December simply as Monster Layer, and was the second game available for the Turbo CD. In this installment, the role of Wonder Boy is played by Leo, who can be joined by Princess Purapril in a two-player co-op mode. As already stated, the game is quite a bit different than previous titles in the franchise, with the setting and art style really being the only thing tying it to its predecessors. This came as a surprise to me, because before playing it, I had always assumed it was an action RPG. In fact, the game reminds me more of Air Zonk, although even that isn't an accurate comparison. Each level is split up into two stages. In the first stage, an auto-scrolling run-and-gun, you need to both dispatch enemies and pick up fruit to keep your health bar from depleting. At the end of the stage, you simply walk into a skull to transition into the shooter stage, at the end of which a boss awaits. A key feature of the game is the variety of weapons. Monster Layer throws a deluge of weapon options at you, and it's up to you to choose which to take and which to ignore based on your situation. The game is approachably difficult, so that you aren't going to beat the game in your first sitting, but also aren't going to rage quit. The early run-and-gun stages can seem a bit sparse, and it feels like eating fruit is more important than killing enemies, but quickly enough the game kicks it into a higher gear so that it's no longer a walk in the park. The graphics are fine, although far from the best the system has to offer. The Redbook audio sounds great, and although it's replete with the electric guitar sound so often associated with early CD soundtracks, overall the music has more of a New Age jazz flavor. Slightly annoyingly, the shooter stages reuse the same music, while the track played during the run-and-gun sections are unique to each stage. Monster Layer is a hard game to judge. When it came out, the game was $50 and the hardware needed to play it was $400, which ironically isn't that far off from what you would pay for each today. But that's the nature of things with the TurboGrafx-16, where these days, relatively speaking, $50 is a fairly average price for a game. Monster Layer is certainly unique in terms of both gameplay and presentation, 
and most importantly, it's fun. Is it the kind of game that would have made me want to buy a Turbo CD in late 1989? Well, no. But looking at the 44 games ultimately released for the system, Monster Layer is easily one of the better titles. Although with the benefit of hindsight we all now know what ultimately transpired during the 16-bit console wars, a litany of great games were released on the TurboGrafx-16 by its first Christmas, and the hits would keep coming in 1990 with titles like Military Madness, Splatterhouse, Ease Book 1 and 2, and of course Bonk's Adventure. But that's all a story for another day. That's going to do it for this episode of Classic Gaming Quarterly. As always, thanks for watching and we'll see you next time.